we can get started, got a good number in. Um, so hi everybody, good afternoon. Um, welcome to today's session. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I feel super honoured to be hosting today's session um, on such an uh, important and pressing topic around young people's mental health and particularly when it comes to exam stress. Um, also, also kind of super topical as today is the first day of Mental Health Awareness Week. Um, so great to be able to kind of kick off the week with a real tangible event on what you can do to support learners' mental health and those that work with learners. Um, so my name is Lauren Roberts and I am the advocacy lead for the City and Guilds Foundation. And my role is all about how do we advocate for people that have barriers to achieving and getting really good training and important opportunities to help them to succeed. And we know that mental health can often be a barrier that isn't always addressed in the right way. And we've actually been hearing all through City and Guilds from our customers and providers that learners' mental health is something that is becoming increasingly important and becoming has been worsened by the pandemic, lockdowns, and of course, COVID-19. We know that there's always been stress when it comes to exams forever, and there may always will be, unfortunately. But with quite a few cohorts of young people never actually sitting formal assessments for the first time until this year and kind of the coming few months, we wanted to do something to make sure that we're recognising learners themselves, but also our education workforce and those that work on the front line to provide great experiences for our learners. So we decided to put together this great panel for you guys. Um, so you can hear from the before, how do we get students ready to sit in exams, what we can do during while you're actually working with your learners while they're sitting exams and going through that process and afterwards to make sure that they come out resilient and confident that they've done their best. So I'm gonna introduce you to our panel first of all um, and then get them to give a short introduction once I've settled your names, just who you are um, and what you do there. So if we can start with Megan McKinnon, who is from City and Guilds. Hello, thank you, Lauren. <laughs> so, hello, everyone. So, I'm Megan. I'm the regional business manager for the South at City and Guilds. So, we're part of the UK sales team, and my team and I we go out to predominantly our colleges and large training providers and talk regularly about our products and services, but how we can support. So, I'm really pleased actually we've been able to pull this together and from the support of foundation and our wider guests here because what's been really apparent in our conversations over the last few months is more than ever because of covid it's exacerbated what our learners are experiencing when it comes to preparation for their formal assessments be it our functional skills our technical exams and apprenticeship and point assessments and it's difficult for our customers so our assessors our exams officers our um, apprenticeship leads to actually support the learners both before the exam and even during their mock tests during and then also after because they're waiting for their results and what's next and their meaningful next steps so I'm really pleased this is one of our kind of our first part of the journey in responding to actually how do we support our customers with that. Thank you Megan um, then we have Kerry Hill from TT Education. Hello, uh, lovely to be joining everybody today. Uh, so as, uh, as you've just heard, I'm Kerry. I'm one of the National School Improvement Partners uh, with TT Education. Uh, prior to that, I've been a head teacher for over a decade, uh, predominantly in primary schools, uh, and I've been in the education system for about the last 20 years. Um, particular interest and passion around mental health and wellbeing. Uh, as a head teacher, my uh, most recent primary school actually received uh, on two occasions, most recently, literally last week, uh, a Princess Royal training award from Her Royal Highness the Princess Royal. And that was around our work and impact of, of mental health in schools. Uh, I'm also a fellow of the Chartered College of Teaching as well uh, and have a master's in leadership of mental health in schools as well. Uh, so that's why I'm, I'm joining us today and looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Kerry. Um, and last but not least, we've got Professor Amanda Kirby from Do It Solutions. Hello. Hi, and thank you very much for inviting me today. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I'm a professor of developmental disorders. I'm a medic. I'm a GP, ran stress training, worked in adult mental health and children's mental health and run a centre for children for, and adults with neurodivergent traits and 
um, for 25 plus years. I live and breathe neurodiversity and have had a lot of practical experience of working with children, young people and adults who are going through times of stress and particularly exam times are often one of the most stressful for them, who may have a number of reasons for it. Um, I come from a neurodivergent family and I've had first-hand experience of what it's like to be stressful in the stressful household of people who are sitting exams as well. Um, I'm delighted to be here to provide practical experience and some of the research around this stuff as well. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mother. Thank you to all of you, as I said, just for joining me um, on such an important topic. Um, I think it would be good, Megan, just to start with you to almost set the scene a little bit um, and just to kind of ask you a couple of questions just around some of the challenges that, as you mentioned, providers um, have been coming to you with on the extra stress, I guess, that learners are under when it comes to their mental health, um, specifically through the COVID-19 lockdowns. Um, so the first question being, what would you say from kind of the stuff you've been hearing firsthand has been the impact on learners experience and engagement within education due to the lockdowns and kind of having to be educated in a different way over the last few years. Yeah absolutely and so through conversations that we've had with our training providers and this is varied across colleges, training providers and what I've been hearing from our wider teams as well is that because this is their first experiences and coming out of the school environment that they're very daunted, they're having to readdress just simple behaviours, like so going from bedroom to classroom. And so, you know, how, how do you engage with others? How do you dress for work? Uh, basic skills. But because this is their first experience and anyone who's kind of joined most of our webinars and heard it's just, it's about getting into the job, on the job and onto the next job. It's education is about lifelong learning. And if this is their first experience going straight into just feeling really stressed, really anxious, not knowing how to deal with these emotions, not necessarily knowing how to even talk about it as well, because not wanting to turn around to their peers in case they're not feeling differently or a friend feels confident and they don't. And so we really want to make sure they feel safe, protected, comfortable, and that if they don't achieve first time, that's OK, because we've also got support around them for that. So it's just really important. I really don't want learners to think, well, this is education and I don't want to feel like this ever again because education is a great thing. It's something that should be part of your life always. So hopefully we can take a lot from just hearing Amanda and Kerry talk today. And if any of our customers joining the webinar have any uh, considerations, any best practice shares, any questions, it'd be really great to hear. Thank you, Megan, and just such a great point. And as you said, if your first experience is negative, it can often lead people to kind of disengage before it's really even begun. So such a great point. Um, what supports are customers and providers coming to you with? Um, and what kind of support do you think would they need in order to support their learners better when it comes to this topic? It's the first of all, it's just knowing how to have a conversation, how to open up about generally how you're feeling and not just putting this kind of bravado. And um, so just creating that safe space and knowing everyone, because like, we're talking to multiple customers, like everyone's feeling the same. So just knowing we're in, in it together at the moment. But in terms of resources, they want to know how to have those conversations. They don't want to become the expert themselves because they've got other role, roles to do, but where should they signpost for further support, more expert support as well? And then also how they can encourage learners to rely on each other um, and share with each other as well. But they, they don't want it to just be something that, here, go and read this module about it. It needs to be engaging, it needs to be ongoing support and resources as well. So whether we can look at, uh, so some customers have mentioned whether there's an app or a workbook that we could put together, but actually how can it be embedded all along that journey of preparing a learner for their exam or formal assessment? So actually we're dealing with it on an ongoing basis and it becomes the norm rather than something we deal with at the time. So that, that's kind of what's come up. 
Thank you so much, Megan, for setting the scene so well for us. And um, I did just forget to mention, guys, that we do have a Q&A box um, open throughout the whole session. So if you've got any questions for our panellists, please just drop them in or any general questions. Then we've got some time at the end to get around to those. So feel free to use that function as we go. Um, just moving on to Kerry now. Um, obviously, Kerry, you have immense professional experience in this subject, as you like to say in your intro. But you also kind of are facing it firsthand with your own children, um, as you have two children who are kind of preparing for formal assessments um, in the coming weeks, I guess. Um, I just wondered if you had any kind of first-hand insights or experience um, with the audience, both professionally, but also on a personal level. Um, so, so I think we, could, we probably all have experience, whether it's personally or professionally, I say, whether it's me currently as a mum. Uh, so I say I've got a 14-year-old year 10 who's literally gone out of the door this morning to mock exams. Uh, and an 18 year old that her first A level is, is literally in two weeks time. Uh, but we, we all know what it feels like to be in situations where we are stressed. Um, we've, we've probably all been through a, a, a testing or exam situation or just a situation where, where we have that, that stress response. Um, I say on a, on a personal level for me, it's as a mum now trying to figure out actually where I've got a 14 year old this morning that has, has kind of woken up and gone, it's going to be awful. It's going to be terrible. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be able to do my best. Uh, and it's only Monday uh, and she has a whole week of exams to go actually figuring out, well, well, what's going to work well with her? Because again, we can obviously talk about strategies that we can uh, provide to support our young people. Um, but our young people are also different. So a one size fits all approach doesn't necessarily work all the time, although obviously there are some really great groundings that we can give. So very much for her, it's been a case of, you know, she overthinks, she's very critical on herself. So trying to remove that pressure, uh, what can she do beforehand maybe to distract herself or, or ground herself so she's not constantly thinking from seven o'clock in the morning until when she doesn't hit the exam room until 11 o'clock. What, what are you going to be doing to help? Uh, she likes Rubik's Cube, so she's taken her Rubik's Cube with her to do on the bus and, and things like that. Um, and again, I know when she walks in the door at night as a parent, the last thing she's going to want from me is, how did the exam go? What was it like? What question? Did, which question did you miss out? Which question did you... That's not going to help her because that's just going to add more pressure uh, and almost that deconstructing of the day. She's just going to need to kind of forget it, done that, can't change it. So let's actually just reframe and move on. Um, so I think very much as, as adults, whether it's as a parent, whether it's as education professionals, um, or whatever kind of setting or sector you're in, um, you know yourself and you know the children or young people you're working with. Uh, so it's being able to actually have those honest conversations beforehand of what, what's going to work for you? What, what do you want us to say, you know, as, as a mum? What is going to help you? What isn't going to help you? Uh, so we can actually just be really honest about how we can support um, I say children and young people or even adults having worked with apprentices as well that maybe have been you know in a job and literally suddenly they've got 10 minutes until they take a test and trying to reduce that that stress at that point um 18 year old again it's really difficult and this is where in education um I think we've got to look at the mentally healthy approach to exams uh, yes, we have high stakes testing, but it's how we can reduce the pressure of that high stakes. Children and young people don't need reminding every day for two years, you've got A-levels coming up in the summer. They know they have A-levels coming up in the summer. They know they have GCSEs. They don't need this constant pressure of when you take your SACs, when you take your GCSEs, when you take your A-levels. Uh, what we need to be doing is in an emotionally healthy way, supporting uh, our young people to have the skills, the strategies uh, and the flexibility to be able to cope and adapt with these stressful situations uh, rather than having that, that constant pressure and conversation, uh, which just fuels the stress and anxiety. 
Thank you, Kerry. Just kind of in all that was so much great information. Um, just kind of flipping it slightly. Um, could you tell us about the importance of actually supporting educators um, and their actual own well-being and their mental health rather than directly the learner? Well, again, we know from all the research that's out there, uh, and in particular, if we look at the most recent kind of teacher wellbeing index, uh, we know now that 77% of education professionals are actually reporting symptoms of, of poor mental health due to their work in, in education setting. We know that 72% of teachers report themselves being stressed. That actually increases to 84% if you're a senior leader within a school. Uh, and we know that actually schools, education was, was at a poor point before COVID. Uh, COVID has just now exacerbated all of those feelings of stress, uh, anxiety. We've had, you know, lack of social contact, uh, loneliness, isolation, uh, not being able to maintain routines. Uh, so we do know, again, that there's a lot of pressure within the sector uh, in terms of recruitment and retention now. Uh, and uh, about 50, 54% of professionals uh, have actually considered leaving the education sector within the last, the last two years. So supporting mental health, whether it's teachers, teaching assistants, anyone within the sector is critical. Uh, and that very much has been a focus of, I say, uh, particularly of, of my own through things like my master's and, and then the work we've been doing in schools. Um, it's not rocket science, is it? Happy staff, mentally healthy, feeling valued, feeling encouraged, being motivated to do well in your job as a, as a teacher, as an adult, is going to help you to perform to your best in your role. That's going to help our children and young people do their best in the classroom. Um, as I say, it's not rocket science. Happy adults make for happy students. Uh, and it kind of is that simple. Uh, so we do need to be making sure we are supporting emotionally and psychologically safe workplaces for our staff so that they can do their best. Uh, and the reason that is critical is because there is, there is research that where our teachers are stressed, where they have a decrease in their own well-being, that actually directly impacts uh, on the well-being and the stress levels of the students in their care. Uh, so it's important not just for stuff in terms of being able to perform, being able to support the children and young, young people in their care, uh, but actually for themselves to, to be motivated, engaged and, and enjoy working. Uh, and that's what we want. We want schools to be a place of love and learning uh, and not just a paycheck. Thanks, Kerry. Kind of just leads on really well uh, to the next question, which is just um, in your experience, how does kind of seeing and investing in that good emotional mental health in teachers and educational staff actually benefit the well-being of the students they're interacting with? Uh, so we, I say, I know from our experience, we uh, it was about 2016, 2017 that we actually started prioritising mental health and well-being as the golden thread within within my school. Um, the school had never, ever been good at Ofsted, uh, very high levels of deprivation, high levels of special educational needs, high safeguarding. Um, and I, we were kind of the highest level of national deprivation. Uh, we had high levels of kind of teacher absence, uh, again, stress, depression, anxiety within our staff. But we consistently looked at changing that culture to be one which was more mentally healthy. Uh, both for our staff and also our students. Uh, and ultimately the impact was, was quite phenomenal. Now, absolutely the staff work incredibly hard, but by putting well-being and mental health at the heart of our, our school culture, uh, ultimately then it not only improved attendance rates of both pupils and staff, uh, but then it also supported improved academic results. So by 2018, 2019, as I said, although we were the highest level of deprivation, uh, our progress outcomes were actually top 1% in the country. Um, so for, for us, that impact um, has, has been quite significant for us. Um, but as I say, it, it isn't a tick the box. It isn't a bolt on. Uh, it has to absolutely be part of the culture that you're developing. 
Um, otherwise, it's it's just not sustainable. So for us, lots of things uh, that we've done with our staff, there are those kind of day to day things in terms of uh, enabling staff to have the support they need. Uh, so we used counsellors, uh, supervision. Uh, we did, I say, our latest training award was around developing self-efficacy uh, and working with psychologists. Uh, but then through to actually, you know, saying thank you to people, walking around the building every day and making connections, uh, having a cuppa and a chat uh, with people. Uh, and celebrating what they're doing, allowing them to learn and grow and, and have career development, all those things can support mental health of our, our workforce as well as with our students. Thank you, Kerry. And just lastly on that, are there any tools or resources that you know that exist um, that can actually directly support educators, learners, exam supervisors during this process? Uh, so again, I think it depends what, what aspect we're wanting to support. I mean, in terms of um, actual uh, staff, maybe who are supporting exams themselves, I think is really important because I know um, Professor Kirby is going to speak more specifically about supporting students. Um, but obviously there are resources out there. I mean, Ofqual does produce a fact sheet for supporting kind of student stress, uh, as well as charities like Young Mind, The Mix, uh, and mentally healthy schools. I think for me, importantly, for those, those adults that are supporting young people through this journey, uh, many of the strategies will also though be the same for them. So as I said, think about before we even get to the exam, think about the environment that you're creating first. So think about the kind of language uh, that you're using with the students before we even get to exams. Um, how are you framing an exam? Is it as that positive to demonstrate your skills, your knowledge and your application, or is it just it's a pass and fail? Uh, so thinking around that is really important. Again, making sure in yourself, you're also getting sleep, you're getting rest, uh, you're getting a good diet, uh, because again, you're going to feel stressed because you care. Uh, you want your students to do well. So you might not realise it in the moment, uh, but you also are going to have all of those stress hormones fizzing around your body. Uh, so looking after yourself is, is really important. That I think as well, be really self-aware. So be aware to regulate your own levels of stress, because obviously students will see that, they will feel that. Uh, so you need to, uh, our staff, we talk about them being a mirror uh, so thinking about how you present, what you say, how you behave will be mirrored in others. So if you come in in the morning really stressed and frazzled, uh, then that obviously is going to transfer onto, onto your students. I think for those exam invigilators, which again, are my father-in-law is an exam invigilator, um, pieces of advice which, which are quite small but make a difference. Think about what shoes you wear. Uh, make sure you're wearing comfy shoes because you're going to be on your feet for quite a number of hours. Um, I would say make sure as well the soles are comfy uh, and don't squeak uh, because A, you're going to be very aware that if you're walking around a room with squeaky shoes, uh, it's going to do your anxiety. But then children and young people are going to hear the squeaky shoes. Um, again, think about clothing. Make sure you've got water or, or something to stay hydrated. Uh, and almost strategize. So pre-plan, have a think about where you become stressed or a student you're supporting becomes stressed. Then maybe what are some of those strategies that you're going to offer them in terms of you know, mindfulness, such as breathing practice, how you can help them reframe the negative thought to a positive thought. So kind of pre-planning some of those as well. Uh, but there are things such as uh, the NHS, so kind of Every Mind Matters, Stress Busters, uh, Five Ways to Wellbeing, all of those things are kind of resources are there to support adults uh, managing stress just as, as they are students as well. Thank you so much, Kerry, especially for those kind of practical bits at the end there that people can actually kind of take away. So thank you. Um, just bringing you now in, Amanda, um, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit just around about neurodiversity as a whole, um, and then just followed on by why is it relevant to this conversation about exam stress and anxiety? Sure, I can. 
So neurodiversity is a term that some people will be familiar with, some people will be less familiar with, and it's really starting off with the way we think, move, process, act, and communicate. We're all neurodiverse, but some of us are neurodivergent. And, and that might be students who may have conditions or traits around dyslexia, dyspraxia, ADHD, autism, developmental language disorder. It means we have we can diverge and have challenges in some areas. And this is where exams are very pertinent because it might be that you have a challenge with writing and recording at speed. It might be you have a challenge focusing and attending. It might be that you are hypersensitive to certain situations. So those squeaky shoes in the exam when somebody's walking around might bother some, but they might incredibly irritate somebody who's really picking up on those sounds around you. You also, you might have some really good strengths as well, so you can diverge positively. And it's those strengths that we're capturing in the exam situation is what we want to try and showcase for that individual to be successful. So the exam time for some people who are neurodivergent is a really challenging time. Because for some, the environment you're putting somebody in isn't always the best environment for them. They might find actually when they are in a classroom and they can talk and engage and they're learning, that this is really the, a great place for them. But where they've got to handwrite and record and understand the questions and the way they're framed, for some students, this is much harder for them. So that, you know, for the neurodiverse student, you might also have higher rates of anxiety. We know that uh, students who are neurodivergent have much higher rates of mental health challenges like anxiety and depression. So it can be a bit like a double whammy here. We've got challenges in the exam situation itself that might make it harder for them to focus and attend and to record and get their ideas out and also coming through the door with heightened anxiety already. So it's a particularly difficult challenging time, I think, for some. Thank you, Amanda. So kind of with all of that being said, how can we do better to support learners before, during and after um, when it comes to that exam stress and anxiety that we've spoken about? So really building on what Kerry was saying that, you know, we're all, we're, we've all learners at different stages. And if we're, a, if we're an educator, a teacher supporting other people, same goes for the students themselves. So beforehand is to try to understand and get yourself into good habits, those healthy habits. So your emotional well-being is going to be really important and to understand the strategies that keep you your best self. So supporting the learner to know that actually having regular sleep will mean that you're more likely to perform better. So not burning the midnight oil and switching your, so if you're sleeping and you have a regular sleep pattern just before the exams, you don't want to be working all night because it will, you'll wake up feeling jet lagged almost in a sense and not be able to perform your best. Um, eating regularly and taking exercise, all of those things are going to be really helpful. Up front, if you've got time still, you know, for students coming into exams over the next period, is to really understand what's going to be asked of you in the exam itself. Can you read the questions? Can you understand the questions? Have you got a process you're practicing to go through when you get into the exam room? And as we've heard earlier today that, you know, a lot of students haven't been there. They haven't been in these situations before. What is it going to feel like? And for somebody who's neurodivergent, it is going through what it's going to be, what the room's going to be like, how many people are around, where you're going to be sitting, how long you're going to be there. So you've got a process, you're rehearsing that before you go into that situation. What's going to happen in the room is going to be, okay, if you do get brain freeze and brain fog, what happens if you're really anxious? How are you going to deal with that? And having some strategies there and now to deal with and practicing them beforehand. So you can do things like breathing, focusing on the moment. So if you really find everything's gone out the window and you can't think of anything, is to come back into the moment, look at your hands, focus on the lines on your hands, rub your hands together, something that's not going to disturb other people around you if you're in a room full of other people, taking some deep breaths in and out, and then taking a breath and then starting again and practicing those strategies so people feel that they're forewarned if that's going to happen, I've got those things in place. And then really making sure that you are, you know what's going to happen, uh, how long you're going to be there. What, what are your pinch points for you? For some people, it might be a lack of time awareness of not knowing I've got six questions to answer in the next 60 minutes. 
when to move on. And for some students, actually having a, bright, a vibrating watch that pings every 10 seconds can be really helpful. So there are strategies you can have which don't interfere with anybody else, but could really make a difference if you find that time estimation is difficult for you. It's a bit difficult to get exam adjustments too late in the day. So up front, if somebody needs adjustments, is trying to get them in place early on. So that person can get up and have a movement break or they can use have the extra time that might make a difference to them. Afterwards, well, I think the bit that Kerry said is that, you know, is practicing exactly what we're preaching, which is not deconstructing. So avoiding having massive deconstruction with other students around you, what went well, what didn't go well, it doesn't help. And especially if you've got a series of exams coming up, if you've been shaken by one, it really has an impact on other exams that might be happening as well. So park it and talking about what's gonna happen. So preparing your student, when you go home, don't start deconstructing the exam that you've just gone. Go for a walk, talk to, talk to somebody, watch some telly or watch, go on a computer game, take yourself out of your space, but don't go back and deconstruct what you can't change at that moment and practicing those skills beforehand so you're ready and prepared. I think that's the biggest thing with all of this is preparing for each of these elements beforehand, not waiting for catastrophe to happen. Thank you, Amanda. Um, you've spoken previously just around the importance and the idea of minimising challenges for individuals and kind of maximising on their strengths kind of as individuals. Could you provide some, as you've just done, um, a few more practical examples, I guess, of what that might actually look like um, for an individual and supporting a learner to do that for themselves? Sure. So a, a lot of students are planning and organising in time management, but can be really difficult. So that organising your time within an exam, but even actually study periods. So one of the things is that if you find it, you lose focus. So you're you start off with good intentions to to do your revision, and off you go down a darkened room and go off into a number of different areas, and you're going on the internet all the time, and you've lost time. So you could use a focus blocker. So if you're going on your computer and you're reading your notes, you could use a focus blocker, which stops you going on other sites for a period of time. That can be really helpful. Um, you can use something like the Pomodoro technique where you have 25 minutes and a five minute break and get used to allocating time. So you're not drifting off and finding that you've lost an hour and, and you're under pressure. Putting, so, time allocation can really be important as well, okay? So the, I think those are two important things that are really difficult for some students particularly. Um, I think using, mentor, using peer mentors or working with other people who are working, who are doing the same exams, as long as you're focused on those sessions you're doing, otherwise it can be a sort of great social party that's happening. So setting up with somebody and doing a peer-to-peer -peer sessions where you each prepare a topic and then you relay that back to each other. That can really be helpful because it can be really isolating. This is Mental Health Week and this one of the things that's focused on this week is loneliness. And I think you feel quite isolating when you're preparing for exams that you feel like everybody else is getting on and it's okay. But having a study buddy that you can work with can really help to see, feel not so alone as well. Um, having a safe space to talk to individuals that you feel safe with, so that might be your parents at home, it might be somebody in, in, if you're in school or, or a tutor, that you can voice your concerns if you don't understand something about the exam. For some people, the experience of taking the exam and doing badly is working out, why did I fail? and actually not repeating those experiences again. So learning from that. So that might be understanding the language. So some people who are neurodivergent have difficulties understanding the words that are used on the page and creating a glossary of terms of what those, those questions mean can really be helpful. And having that beside yourself and practicing that when you're reading exam papers and preparing can really make a difference as well. So the language that's being used, planning and organization and your social and emotional well-being would be the three areas that are challenging, that stop you being your best self, and they're the things that you can do something about. 
Amazing. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, we're going to move on now to a Q&A session. So I've had quite a few questions come through uh, in the Q&A function as well as the chat. Um, so I'm just going to ask one first that's coming through the Q&A while we look through the chat questions. Um, but this question really is about um, kind of, I guess, from the personal level of someone who actually has a child themselves who is currently, who is currently taking exams, sorry, um, has really done their best to reassure her that she's smart and she's going to do great, um, but she's not really managing to get through properly and it's actually as we spoke about the idea that young people are heavily influenced by their peers um, and not kind of by what parents are saying all the time I wondered if potentially we could start with you Kerry and then bring in Amanda of how can you on a personal level um, reassure a child or a young person in your life that they'll be fine and they're kind of doing their best is all they really can do and that fear of failure piece I wonder if you want to kick us off Kerry um, I think, first of all, it's really difficult because um, sometimes actually your your child won't listen to you as a parent because it's just not what they're hearing. Um, it's not in their, their headspace at that point, uh, particularly as well as a, as a primary school head teacher. I know children when they're kind of taking their sacks at 10, 11. Um, actually, for them, there are so many other influences that are more important or that they prioritise more than their parents. Uh, and again, as a parent, this is where we need to make sure we've got good communication from the school, because whereas we can be reassuring our children, as we say, about the importance or, or you know, as I said to my daughter this morning, you know, the sun is still going to come out tomorrow. The world is not going to end um, because of the test today. But actually, when you're in that heightened state of stress, um, there are some things that you're just not going to hear uh, where you're in that that very fixed negative mindset. Um, so I think it is important as a parent to make sure you're knowing what information is coming from the school. So what strategies, what tips, what suggestions is the school saying? Uh, also, particularly because I, I think on the chat, it was a key stage two child. Um, again, what do, we've talked about, and, and as uh, Professor Kirby's just said, language. Uh, as we mentioned, what language is being used, particularly with our youngest children, uh, you know, our, our early teens, what language is being used with it? Is there pressure being applied uh, to the children that you have to do well, even at the age of 10, 11? Because if you don't, it'll affect the groups or the sets that you're put in at secondary school or it will affect this or it'll affect that. If those messages they're getting six hours a day in school, that can then be very difficult for a parent to try and reframe at home. Uh, so I think, as, as Amanda has kind of said, making sure that we are not dissecting the day, that we're finding out those strategies to reduce some of the pressure uh, to support. Um, and then all really we can do as parents is, is that, that reassurance uh, and trying to make sure that resilience is still there uh, that no matter how you do on one day, that one day isn't going to affect the next exam or the next day or the rest of the week. Uh, so it really is take it one day at a time. Uh, but also if we can develop that uh, metacognitive thinking. So actually let's think about all the, let's not think about all the negatives that you've now come out. Because I did it, I know I'd come out of an exam and I wouldn't think about all the questions I'd done well. I'd be like, oh, if I'd only added that or put that or done this, uh, where really what we need to be thinking of, OK, so what do I know about that subject? How can I start? Have I seen something like this before? Have I come across a similar thing? Do I know a strategy that I can use first? So that kind of metacognitive thinking can kind of really help them to move forwards and get us looking forwards to their next exam rather than looking back at things that we think have gone wrong. Thanks, Kerry. Do you want to come in with anything there, Amanda? Yeah, I think as a parent, it's, it is really difficult because you're, you're saying those words and saying, it's all going to be fine, don't worry, I'm here for you. And that's what every parent says and, and means it. I think there are ways of and times and places that can make that easier. Sometimes going for a walk with a child, sometimes driving in a car alongside your child can be a time when you can start to sort of explore uh, 
so it's not so direct, indirectly, sometimes you can have better conversations and explore other particular things that your child is really worried about. So worry is a big heading. What might be is that I'm worried about and, and there's something you can practically do. So, and again, as Kerry says about finding out what, what's going on in school. So what, you know, what has been said in school? Are there other children that are saying things as well? So trying to find out in more informal ways that are safe, to do so, find out what is what is it that's worrying her, because the, this this child is not sleeping and not eating, and so that is concerning. You know, when you see that, uh, sometimes it's difficult when you're feeling anxious to articulate it. So, trying to put some words into the feelings can sometimes be very helpful. And um, I also think that giving your child strategies to cope with the feelings of anxiety is really important. So, ensuring that they are getting some exercise. So if it is between exams, going for a walk, going for a swim, going for whatever you do, you know, going to the park, having a run around, really important because it's going to help their appetite and it is going to help their sleep. So again, that's going to help them to manage in the classroom as well, you know, in those situations. And I think again, is reiterating that whatever happens tomorrow, there is another day after it. Even though you're, you don't think your child is hearing it, they will be hearing it to some extent. And I think it, it, it's worth reiterating that, you know. Um, so I, I think it's looking more globally, what are the other issues that might be around and trying to get your child to articulate those and put them in words. Perfect. Thank you, Mani. Just, just sticking with you, we've had a couple of questions around, I guess, in a kind of a classroom setting, the best way to get this information to learners. Um, and that potentially, you know, talking at them might not always work and their activities often work better. And then we also had a question just around how we work in this kind of remote world. Um, are there any ways that you could engage with learners remotely um, or any activities that you've seen that work well to get that same kind of message across, um, but potentially in more of an engaging practical way? I think the, I'm, I'm very keen that we, we provide our learners with the strategies that they can use in times of stress and exam is one of those. So using face, so focus, attend, uh, come into your space and re-engage, giving that the, the learner something to do. And we practice that very much. So focusing on what's in front of you, attending to detail breathing in and out and coming back into your space and then re-engaging and practicing those skills. So we do that in a, you can do that anyway, you can do that remotely, yeah. Um, I think also that when we're trying to start to do uh, remote working of preparing individuals for, for examination times, is to have a discussion, is to understand that we're all feeling like this. So a shared feeling, because often, you feel quite isolated because you're the only one who's feeling stressed about exams and everybody else seems to be so good and seems to be coping very well. I think actually having psychologically safe spaces to have those conversations and say, this is something that we all feel like and sharing ideas of what works for each of us means that we don't feel so alone. And we can do that in remote spaces as well. And, and learning from each other, what have other people done to, to, to prepare for those situations? What are they doing? And learn from other students can be really helpful as well. So I think it is about not just uh, a teacher saying this is what's good for you, but sharing in uh, other experiences what people have found useful as well. Thank you, Maida. Just kind of going back on that point on teachers, Kerry, um, we had a question just asking to know a little bit more about um, how you manage to put kind of good mental well-being and health at the heart of your school um, and a little bit more just on the impact that actually had on staff. Oh, we could spend a whole separate hour just just on on that topic. Um, yeah, I literally can can talk for I could get a gold medal in the Olympics for for talking about that. Um, but there's lots of different ways. I think certainly from our perspective uh, and from all the research there, it can't be a bolt on and it can't be an afterthought. Um, so a lot of schools now are trying to I I would say do the gimmicks. Oh yes, we'll do Chocolate Friday. We'll give you um, we'll give you an afternoon off to go and you know, you know do whatever you want. Um, we'll we'll give you a workshop on on yoga uh, and things like that. Um, but ultimately, they're quite reactive strategies. That's we need to be more proactive. 
uh, mental health has to be a whole school culture. It can't just be a bolt on or a gimmick or it's just not going to be sustained. Uh, and really, I think we're, we're talking much more now about um, psychologically safe workplaces. And it's very much been used more in terms of business environments. Google did a really big project on it called Project Aristotle. Uh, Amy Edmondson's done a lot of work in healthcare settings, uh, but it really is about thinking about the culture that we're fostering. Uh, we want our staff to feel confident, to feel motivated, uh, to feel that they can learn and grow. But importantly, uh, we've just uh, kind of heard about the importance of honest conversations with our students. You know, let's talk about your feeling stressed. Let's talk about how, you know, have an honest conversation. As a school leader, actually, I want my staff to be able to go, do you know what, Kerry, I just want to come and moan at you. Um, or this is really worrying me. Or can we have a chat about this? Or, you know, there's this initiative. Actually, I've got a better idea. And go, great, let's have a listen to it. Uh, where we aren't giving agency, we aren't giving control, uh, we aren't giving our staff autonomy, um, then that has a massive impact on, on their mental health in the workplace if they feel they're constrained by systems um, or they're just having to tick the box and they don't really know why, the purpose of it, um, or actually what's the point to it. Uh, so as a leader, that, that vision that you create, getting everybody on board, why are we working together? What are we aiming for? And actually, how can every single person in that school collaborate, connect and work together to achieve the best for the school as a whole, but also achieve the best for themselves and for each individual student? Uh, we need to be having more of those conversations. Uh, specifically impact for us so as I say we started our work in in about 20 end of 2016 2017 um, in 2016-17 academic year uh, there were 151 days of absence taken because of stress anxiety depression uh, I say we then started really really unpicking mental health and well-being in the school uh, in the following academic year, after we'd put in place a lot of different measures uh, and really started focusing on a mentally healthy culture, uh, our stress absent rate reduced to zero uh, in terms of that. Uh, and that was what we got our first Princess Royal Award for. Now, actually, after that, uh, we have had increased absence rates, but that's because we've said to people, we can recognise that maybe actually you need to take a bit of time, uh, you know, and and everybody has mental health. It's a continuum. Um, so we all get stressed. We all get anxious. And actually, we need to kind of be able to bring our whole selves to work. Uh, we need to be able to show up no matter, you know, how we're feeling, but know how we can manage that effectively where we are. And unless as leaders we support our staff to do that, um, then we're not going to create that, that mentally healthy culture. Um, but yeah, if, if people are interested, maybe that's a, a follow-up session to think about because so much we could talk about and probably not enough time. Thanks, Kerry. Um, we've got another great question from Nika, which I think could also be um, another whole hour topic, but looking at how do we offer kind of bespoke support um, and advice to people who are working with um, looked after children. So children with maybe more complex needs uh, who have been through trauma um, or at high risk of suicide or self-harm. I'm not sure we want, if anybody would like to come in first on that one. Maybe Amanda? Yeah, I'll come in with that. Um, I think the first thing is, is bespoke. I think that's really important. So um, not all children are the same, we all know that they're all different, and a looked after child may well have, uh, may have trauma in a number of different ways. So we know there are higher rates of neurodivergent traits amongst individuals, children who are looked after, higher rates of additional learning needs for a number of different reasons. There may be um, attachment issues as well, and we're also finding uh, some students will have had a head injury. 
So actually physical trauma, tra traumatic brain injury as well. Now, each one of those elements are going to have an impact on the well-being of that individual and how they're presenting. And if they are at high risk of suicide and self-harm, there are going to be multiple reasons for leading them to have a higher risk. So this is really important that we understand the underlying reasons for that, because you can't put a package together and say, these kids are looked after, off you go, because each child's going to have a different eco ecosystem and the reasons for it. So by being person-centered, we can start to say, okay, let's look at the different elements that are going on for this, this child who's around them and that means having someone that they can have a safe conversation with and it's also going to mean that you're going to have to liaise with other professionals who are in that that child's ecosystem as well consistency and messaging is going to re be really important for that young person that they do feel safe that they feel safe to have the conversations that they want to and if you've got children who are looked after have higher rates of ADHD, they have higher rates of developmental language disorder. So it's going to be really important that the way that information is communicated and the conversations you're having in is a way, way that that young person can understand at a level that they can understand and that they can communicate in a way that's meaningful for them as well. So each of those elements needs to be understood. And by doing that, you're starting to understand, going back to Maslow's hierarchy, are there some very basic needs that we need to address for that young person to allow them to be safe, to be able to have conversations, to feel better and to reduce the risk factors for them. And that, that's, that, and these are complex and they're not simple things and they need to be understood with each individual. And we have to move away from going looked after children, it's all attachment disorder or, or you know, um, and not assuming, making assumptions. And obviously following on from that now, we know with uh, within the new kind of keeping children safe and education document, uh, we know that now mental health is classed as a vulnerability. Uh, so actually schools should be looking at those children who have higher risk factors, um, I say adverse childhood experiences. Uh, and as we said, that, that personalization, so looking at what that targeted or individualized approach is, and where those children do have that higher risk factor, uh, they should have some element of, a, of an individualized plan uh, for how they're going to be supported. And again, we know if we know that, for example, high stress is going to be a particular trigger, uh, if there has been a, an adverse childhood experience um, or, or a transition or a change of, or changing period, then obviously schools, again, should be being proactive and looking at what is going to be put in place to support that child before it becomes a trigger, rather than actually waiting until actually the child is, you know, an hour away from an exam and actually in a crisis point. Uh, so actually it's about being proactive as well with that. Um, and we do now know ultimately for, for all children, uh, there was a Children's Commissioner report in 2020 uh, and actually 66% of children and young people aged 5 to 16 uh, report that exam stress and homework is their, their biggest stressor uh, and actually comes above, uh, for example, bullying as their, their biggest worry. Uh, so we do know that, that mental health that now has to be something that is on every school education setting agenda. Thank you so much both of you and we're coming to the very end five minutes left but I did just want to kind of touch on a really interesting point that was raised just around how do tutors um, and teachers kind of begin to apply boundaries and kind of what how do they and what is the point where they are able to identify that a learner does need to be signposted um, I wondered if you guys had any thoughts on how boundaries can be implied and then knowing when and how I guess to confidently signpost students or learners you work with to get further support than potentially can be offered in the classroom. I'm not sure if anybody wants to. Amanda? Uh, well, I think the first thing is, is that uh, if you're a teacher and you're, and you're recognising and you know your children you start to recognise change in pattern of behaviour and if that's Something you've not seen previously in that child, recognizing that times building up to exams are going to be times of stress that may be a tipping point for a child that might have been coping so far. The additional stress of coming up to the exam period might be the tipping point. 
is being aware of a change in behavior. And that might be quiet, more introverted behavior or disruptive behavior. So we, we manifest our, our stress in different ways, very differently from one person to another. So seeing a change. I think that if you are um, talking to parents and having conversations with parents in primary school is often easier to do than in secondary school but actually maintaining those communication lines with parents and hearing, like we've heard from somebody today about a parent is worried about their child, is having those conversations to know what's going on at home as well, to know, is there, are there other things going on? Because the other thing is, other things go on in your life as well as exams that might be a tipping point for somebody not coping today. So keeping those lines of communication. And, and also what we've been saying is about sharing conversations with students that they understand that this might be a time of stress, but also what are the other things you can do? So providing strategies and keeping in mind with that. But we are seeing there are some students who really do suffer uh, and have are become mentally unwell. We talk about mental health, but we see some, some students who become mentally unwell and have mental illness at this time and develop high rates of anxiety and, and worse, and suicidal feelings and thoughts. Uh, and I think that we must always be mindful of that, that there are going to be students around where this time is very, very stressful for them and a time they can't cope. And being able to tap into, if you've got counsellors in school, or referring out to local CAM services where, where possible, there are long waiting lists and high demand, which is a real challenge, I think, quite often is recognising that we may need to be referring some students talking to parents where appropriately to get a referral at least to their GP to discuss things more. So I think that is really important too. Thank you, Amanda. Um, did anybody else have any final 30 second thoughts just on that point around signposting um, and kind of when and where and how to do it correctly? Uh, sorry, Carrie. All right, sorry, Megan. So again, from a school perspective, uh, schools should have a graduated approach. Uh, they should have a referral pathway uh, for identifying mental health uh, needs within their students and then what their pathways look like, both for what support will be in schools, but then what their triaging or referral is to external agencies, whether that's external agencies within a particular authority, a particular multiple academy trust, or referring into then, for example, GP or even CAMS. Uh, so again, I would first of all kind of say to people, go and find out what your school policy is, uh, what are your kind of identification and referral procedures. Um, but as, as Amanda kind of said as well, you, you know your students. Um, you know, we know our students really well. So you'll know when your student, as you say, is coming in really tired, uh, maybe not eating, uh, their mood is changing and all of those little kind of signs that start you going actually I'm not sure something's okay here even if you're not sure just go and have a conversation with somebody else have a conversation with your Senko if you have got senior mental health lead or again places like CAMS just have an advice line for practitioners uh, so go and have a conversation uh, if you're not sure or you're worried. Perfect. So that brings us to exactly time. Um, so just thank you again um, to all of my amazing panellists and thank you to everybody for attending today. Um, we will send around um, a link with resources in a feedback form. So please do um, have a read um, as well as a recording to this if you wish to share with colleagues um, or just anyone in your network. But yeah, have a good afternoon, everybody. Um, and thank you very much for attending. <laughs>